and every hour. Witnessing thy power to save me, setting free from self and sin, thou who boughtest to possess me, in thy fullness, Lord, come in. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Jesus, fill now with thy spirit, hearts that full surrender know that the streams of living water from our inner man may flow. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. All right, turn over to 468, 468. More like my master, or as our old songbook said, more more like my savior. Our one said, more like the master, which I liked better for a title. Anyhow. More like my savior I would ever be. More of his meekness more humility, more zeal to labor, more courage to be true, more consecration for work he bids me do. Take thou my heart, I would be thine alone. Take thou my life, and make it all thine own. Purge me from sin, O Lord, I now implore. Wash me and keep me thine forevermore. More like my Savior is my daily prayer. More strength to carry Crosses I must bear, more earnest effort to lead some soul to Him, more of His Spirit, the wanderer to win. Take Thou my heart, I would be Thine alone. Take Thou my life and make it all thine own. Purge me from sin, O Lord, I now implore. Wash me and keep me thine forevermore. More like my Savior, I would live and grow. More of his love to Others I would show more self-denial like his in Galilee. More like my Savior I long to ever be. Take thou my heart, Lord, be thine alone. Take thou my life and make it all thine own. Purge me from sin, O Lord, I now implore. Wash me and keep me thine forevermore. All right, at this time, we're going to have the choir to come and sing. And I think you all are going to enjoy this because at the end of the second verse, we have a key chain and that change and every once in a while we find we know what we're doing that was just a way to remind the choir <laughs> Give up your best to the master. Give up the 
Thank you, choir. I really appreciate that. So it's nice to have you here this evening. A couple of announcements here. We're gonna, uh, we are gonna actually resume some normalcy, I think, and, and uh, we'll go ahead and, and take an offering here in just a moment. We we'll resume doing that here on Sunday evenings. You know, we've took a hiatus on that for a long time. A um, couple of announcements first. Before I forget, uh, there is a lot of food that is in our book room. Now we keep a small food pantry, and a lot of things that are in there right now are expired, but chances are they're probably still good. And so if you are if you feel like taking a risk, we would encourage you to uh, go into the book room and take whatever you would like. All right? Were you laughing over there? No? Okay. I thought she was laughing there. Um, please do that. Okay? It, anything that we that is, uh, that is left in there is going to be thrown away. And so we've got a lot of it that's sitting on uh, where we have our Bibles, and then also there's a desk in there as well. So please take a look in there. Uh, perhaps you don't need it, but somebody else does. That would be another route to, to do as well. So if you can give that to somebody, be a blessing to them, please do that. So stop in the book room afterward and check that out. Uh, there's going to be a brief meeting after the service uh, for those that are involved in the Christmas program. And so, yes, ma'am? Only the people that have parts. Only the people that have yeah, parts. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Amen. Well, she said parts. I thought she said hearts. Hearts. <laughs> Only those with hearts. That's right. That's right. That's good. Um, let's see here. I don't have my list in front of me, so I'm trying to remember some of the things that we have going on. Oh, uh, so this this one's a little bit uh, concerning there, and so. My wife doesn't even know this yet, but I talked to Sister Michelle this morning, so we're going to have to think about what we're going to do here. But the family camp is coming up this next week. We were planning on going. Uh, however, they have had uh, COVID-19 has ran through Liberty Baptist Tabernacle. I think all but 12 people have like had it there at their church. Of course, those that are, are currently infected won't be going to family camp, but there is that risk, of course, of spreading and so for those that are that we're going to family camp, that's just for informational purposes only. Uh, I don't even know what we're going to do. I guess we're going to have to talk about that, honey, and see what we're going to see what we're going to do. So so but uh, but we just need to be careful there. I, I, I don't want to take any unnecessary risk. And so just something to keep in mind. Uh, and then there was. Um, what was it? Wait, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this, so this, not this next Wednesday night, but the following Wednesday night, we're going to try something a little bit different, and we're trying it to see how it works. And essentially what it's going to be is this, is uh, 
is what I'd like to do is for the, I, I encourage everybody to come and pray. I mean, we, we have had Wednesday nights as far as prayer meeting. We're going to do things a little bit different as far as prayer uh, in that we're, we're going to take prayer requests as we normally do. But what I'm going to encourage uh, is, is actually praying in small groups. Uh, so that's going to be the first change. But the second change is going to be this, and that is, is that we're going to start at 6.30. Okay, so we'll see how that goes. Maybe it's a flop, and maybe we might change things again. That will not be this Wednesday, not this Wednesday, the following Wednesday. So I'll announce it again a few more times so that people are well aware of that. Uh, but that, again, the whole goal is, is to try to get us out by 8 o'clock, and so remember that. Thank you for reminding me about that. Yes, ma'am. Tuesday night, thank you. That was the other one. For those of you who are interested in learning more about winning someone to Jesus, witnessing, sharing your testimony, sharing the gospel uh, with the intent that you could actually lead someone to Christ, then what we're going to do is this next Tuesday at 7 o'clock, we're going to meet here at the church. Uh, and it's really going to be more of, a, more of a training, teaching kind of session as far as soul winning is concerned. Now, I know many of you have gone. Uh, witnessing, and what I would encourage you to do is is come and 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 share some of your experiences, and so uh, I think that would be a real blessing for others as well. So please come and do that. Uh, that's going to be Tuesday at seven o'clock. All right. If we could go ahead and have our men come for our uh, evening offering, our ushers, that would be wonderful. They weren't prepared for that, so thank you guys. Amen. Brother Steve, would you return thanks to the Lord for us tonight? Amen. All right, as they finish up back there, uh, next Sunday night will be the first Sunday of the month. And on the first Sunday of the month, we have anybody who who would like to sing a special uh, gets to come on and sing a special. So y'all have that in mind. And then, then, of course, last month, every man got up and sang a special and uh, kind of uh, challenge the ladies. So I don't know if they'll be able to answer that challenge, not for all of the ladies to get up and sing a special or not. But anyhow, the challenge has been issued. So, but anyhow, so that'll be next Sunday night. So it's good to sing into the Lord. So if you have a special you wanna sing, just, just have it ready. All right, 476, 476 is your all on the altar.
You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Would you walk with the Lord in the light of his word and have peace and contentment always? You must do his sweet will to be free from all ill on the altar your all you must lay is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid your heart does the spirit control you can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Oh, we never can know what the Lord will bestow of the blessings for which we have prayed. Till our body and soul He doth fully control On our all on the altar is laid Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid Your heart does the spirit control you can only be blessed in a peace so sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Who can tell all the love he will send from above? Oh, how happy our hearts will be made. Oh, what fellowship sweet we shall share at his feet when our all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. I was going to ask all the men if they thought the wish women would be up to the challenge, but I've decided not to do that. I'm going to ask Pastor if he believes the women will be up to the challenge. Oh, oh, oh. He's just trying to get me in trouble. That's what he's trying to do. Yeah. Well, good evening. Hey, Brother Mason, can we go ahead and put the screen down for us? Go ahead and turn in your Bibles tonight, if you will, over to Luke chapter number... Where are we at? Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and we're going to resume where we left off this morning. As you're turning there in Luke chapter 9, let me uh, encourage you after the service here, we're going to 
honor the Lord's Supper. We want to encourage your participation. If you are a sorry about that. If you are a believer in Christ, we want to encourage you to participate in the Lord's Supper, okay? Uh, parents, know your children, right? Perhaps your children are not saved yet. They shouldn't be participating in the Lord's Supper. And that is okay. In fact, it would be better for them to for you to deny your child the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and for them to ask, you know, Mom, Dad, why, why couldn't I do that? It's a great opportunity for you to sit down with your child and share with them the gospel and to make sure that they are truly born again. That is the important thing, that they're saved. And so this is an ordinance for saved people. Uh, we believe here at this church, we don't believe in something called closed communion or even, cl- what is it, closed communion? I forget the different terms and stuff. I guess we're, what we do is closed communion, I think. I don't remember. I don't know. Right, right. Thank you, brother. Yeah, it's, it's um, in any event, if you're a believer, we, we encourage your participation in that. We are in Luke chapter 9, and we're going to be starting here again in verse number 18. We read verses 18, I believe it was through 26 this morning, and we'll give a brief review. This is really the second part of the message of who is Jesus? That's the question that we asked this morning, and we asked the same question again tonight. Who, who is Jesus? Is He the Christ? Is He your Savior personally? Do you know that you're going to heaven? And we begin here tonight in Luke chapter 9 and verse 18. And it reads, And it came to pass, as He was alone praying, His disciples were with Him, and He asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? And they answering said, John the Baptist, and some say Elias, and others say that He is one of the old prophets, is risen again. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself let him take a, uh, and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what man, uh, for what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. And it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, or Elijah who appeared in glory and spake of his, uh, of his uh, decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. We're in verse 32 now. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses, and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and they kept it close, and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the word of God once again and the opportunity to preach your word. We pray that you would speak to our hearts. Thank you for the work, for your Holy Spirit working in our hearts this morning. And uh, once again, Lord, I ask you to do the same thing. If there's someone here tonight that does not know Christ as your Savior, uh, Lord, tonight can be the night of salvation for them. Uh, So, Lord, I, I pray these things now. Please bless, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And you'll recall this morning that uh, as, we, as we began that there was an overarching message that we discovered as far as who is Christ. 
And as we read in this account, uh, Peter, of course, uh, when Jesus questions and says, who, uh, who do you say that I am? He asks, he asks them, first of all, who do the people say that I am? And then he asks them directly, who do, who do, Pete, who do uh, you say that I am? Peter quips up and he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And of course, you, we see a lot of Peter. Peter is mentioned a lot because he almost seems to be the spokesman of the, of the group. And we're going, to see, uh, we're going to see Peter speaking in other areas tonight as well. Uh, but of course, he made this, this confession. He said that, that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the very Son of God. And we saw this morning how in Matthew's Gospel and in Mark's Gospel, we see that, it, that this was something that was revealed to him of the, uh, of the Father, uh, that it was, it was given to him in that way. Well, the lesson that we discussed this morning, lesson one, was this. If you follow me, it's going to cost you. And we see that, obviously, there in verse number 36, or excuse me, verse 23, verse 23, where Jesus says, uh, And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and, uh, daily and follow me. If you're going to follow Christ, it is going to cost you. We looked at Luke 14, and we, and, uh, and we, we, we saw, and again, another spot where Jesus talked about what it was going to cost people to follow him. And I, I thought, thought about it that even this afternoon as I went home, you know, why is that important? Why, why, why stress that? Why, why isn't following Christ easy? Why is there such a steep cost? And I thought about that uh, for a little while, and it, and it came to my mind that the gospel is something worth dying for. And it's not, I'm not talking about Jesus dying for it. I'm talking about you and I. That the gospel is something worth dying for, that the truth is, is something worth laying down your life for. And a thought occurred to me that how, you know, if, if we can't deny ourselves in the little things of life, how are we ever going to deny ourselves really when it comes to our life or maybe our loved one's life being on the line? And I don't think that's going to happen. I, I was talking with Brother Lou after the service, and we were you know, sharing some anecdotes, and I thought they were very fitting. And, and while we were talking there, the, the thought came to my mind, what's going on over in California today? Of course, Sister Carolyn, you just came from California, and it's, it's a whole lot more crazy over in California. But there are churches today that are holding services, and it is costing them to hold services, literally. They're being fined fined $5,000 per service. Could you imagine... Could you imagine a little church like this and how tempted we would be, you know, in light of, of, of government persecution, pressure from the government. Hey, you can go to a zoo in San Diego where there's thousands of people roaming around, but you can't go to church and you can't sing. We're going to fine you if you do. It's costing them to serve Christ. And I thank God that they're actually standing and they're standing strong. They're standing up and standing out and they're saying, this is worth that this is, this is worth the cost. Assembling together is worth it because we have a command from our Lord. We, serve, we have a higher priority. We have a higher calling. And of course, uh, aside from, from what's going on in California being blatantly unconstitutional. And, and folks, I think it's worth mentioning that. This isn't a political speech or anything tonight. But it's, it's, it's true that we have the right, the freedom to worship. The First Amendment of the Constitution guarantees that. Congress shall, uh, shall make no laws uh, regarding religion or the establishment thereof, or, or, the, or, or uh, I forget, yeah, to, to, to worship or anything like that. That happened even in the state of Wyoming. Uh, of course, I was a little, about, a little bit outspoken with our own governor when our own governor put these things in place. And it's like, hey, wait a second. Uh, as far as pastors are concerned, I don't answer to the government. I'm not an employee of the government. No pastor is. Who do pastors answer to? They answer to God, right? And each church has to do what's right for their people, and, and each pastor has to do what's right for their people, knowing that they have to answer before the Lord someday. And so we have men, and, and uh, uh, we have uh, good people that are in other places, in, the, in our own backyard, in our own United States, that are suffering at the hand of government. They're suffering persecution. It's beginning to cost them something. I, I guess let me go a little bit of a rabbit trail, and I was thinking about this. This next part is free, and it's, it's strictly my opinion. But folks, I think that it's only going to get worse. I think this is just the beginning. Just the beginning. We, I think most people today sense there is an air of change in America. 
that we we are teetering on the edge of something, the edge of the unknown, and we're not sure what it is. But it seems ominous. It doesn't seem like it's good. It seems like our freedoms are at risk. It seems like our liberty is at risk. It seems like our own our own uh, uh, freedom to come and worship is at risk. And I don't think that's too far off. I personally think that darker days are ahead. Again, not to make this a political thing, but I, I really question if President Trump is going to win the election. You say, well, you know, the other guy would be better. I don't think so. Anybody who's going to kill babies is not better. This is factual. Who, who, regardless of who wins, regardless of who wins, I think we're headed for more government infringement, and I think we're we are on the edge of something very great. There's something called many of you are familiar with this, but but monetary policy within the United States, really even around the world, it changes about every forty or fifty years or so. It's changed in your lifetime, in some of your lifetimes in the 70s under President Nixon. The last time it changed, and it didn't seem like it was a very big deal at first. It didn't seem like it really anything changed, but in reality, everything changed. And that was when Nixon actually took us off the gold standard, when our, when our, when our currency wasn't backed by real money anymore. It wasn't backed by gold or silver. It, was, it turned into be uh, completely fiat. That was a huge change, and we've been living on what's been called the global dollar standard now for the last 40 years or so, and we are on the change once again. What many are thinking now is there's uh, something that's going to come out, probably a digital dollar, some kind of digital currency. And by the way, if this doesn't, if, you know, if your radar doesn't go up, if red flags don't go up, uh, as a Christian, they should. Because you think about what Revelation says a little bit later on, uh, when, when in order to buy or sell, you have to receive a mark. Okay, can, could you imagine this? And this isn't too far off. Think about this now. The government might give another stimulus check pretty soon, right? What if they give a, give a stimulus check and they say, we're going to give you a digital wallet and we're going we're gonna to give you $1,000 a month, universal basic in, income? Some people think that's crazy. I don't think that's too far off. I think we're probably heading near those days. Quite fascinating, really but quite scary at the same time. And you think about how much control there is. If you have a digital wallet and the government is giving you money, of course, that's a recipe for hyperinflation, but it's also a rep- uh, recipe for uh, control, right? You either spend, I mean, th- 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 this gets into massive government surveillance where they can see what you're spending, right? They see, can see who you're paying. It's easier for them c- to collect taxes. There's a whole bunch of ramifications that go along with this. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you this, that, that to serve Christ, it's going to cost you something, and you should prepare yourselves today. You should prepare yourself spiritually. You should pre- uh, prepare yourself emotionally. You should prepare your, your family as far as goods and services. Uh, folks, I, I, I already, if many of you have gone to the grocery store, you've seen food prices gone up. We are, we are inflating our debt like crazy. Like crazy. I could, I could spend all service talking to you about uh, our U.S. economics and what the Federal Reserve is doing and how we are hyperinflating our money right now. And it hasn't yet caught up to us, but it will. Could you imagine what it might be like to go to a grocery store and an or, I mean, it, it, think, about, think about it this way. In Venezuela, everybody is a millionaire, right? And they are because it takes millions of dollars to buy a loaf of bread. That's where we're going, folks. That's where we're going. So what should you do? I think you should prepare. Again, this is all free. This is my opinion. But I think you should prepare. I think you should prepare your family. I think if you can take some extra food and store it away, I think you should do that. Not just for your family, but that you can bless others as well. I think you should really prepare in that way. To say, Pastor's gone on. He's, he's on the crazy train. Yeah, I may be on the crazy train a little bit. But seriously, do that. If you can, if you can again... Not that we are to accumulate treasures here upon the earth. That's not the point. But if I think, I think if you take your, your currency, the, your savings, and you transfer that, you buy a little bit of gold and silver, it maintains your purchasing power when inflation eats away at your purchasing power. I think that's just common sense to do. Again, that's all free, and I'm not going to go any more into that. The point here is this. It's going to cost you something to serve Christ, and we are living in those days. In America, where we've lived kind of large and in charge, we've lived kind of high, how do they say that? We've lived, you know, off the fat of the hog, or I don't know how those sayings go, but we've, we've lived very comfortably. It hasn't cost, in other countries it's costing them. And maybe it's time in America that it costs us something too. The question is, will you stand? Will you stand?
So now we're going to get to lesson two tonight. Lesson two is this. Though it's not what you expect, follow me anyway. You say, well, pastor, where are you getting this? This is kind of interesting. As I was studying this out, of course, the first lesson is difficult. If you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you. These aren't words that we like to hear. They're very challenging for us. Uh, but lesson two can be very challenging in and of itself. And of course, we see that. And, and we see this. I took this from verses 27 here in Luke down through 36. So, of course, what, what, we, uh, what we read here just a little bit ago had to do with Jesus telling them. You can see there in verse number 27, he says this, But I tell you of a truth. There, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God. And then the next parts we see here is we see what is commonly re referred to as the transfiguration, where they were taken up. It was three of them, the Bible says. It was what Peter, John, and James. And they went up into a mountain with Jesus, and he was changed right before their very eyes. And, uh, and, his, and his clothes was glistening. They saw him in his glory, if we could say it that way. They saw the king. Uh, coming in his kingdom. And I believe that's exactly what was happening here, that as it says right there in, in verse 27, where Jesus says, there be some of you, and remember who he's talking to, okay? He's talking to them. This is personal. He's talking to the people that are around him. He says, there will be some of you, referring to his disciples, standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom, uh, till they shall see the kingdom of God. And indeed, what I think they've seen here as far as the trans, uh, transfiguration was indeed that. They saw a glimpse of the kingdom of God in their day. Now, this, this makes us think a little bit as far as uh, what they expected about the Messiah and what they expected about the kingdom. All right, so turn with me, if you will, back over to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. And we're going to talk about this a little bit as far as what they expected in regards to the Messiah and what they expected in regards to the kingdom. They were awaiting a kingdom. They were awaiting the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God to come in their day. Matthew chapter 16. We see something similar here. Of course, this expounds on, on the same conversation. In Matthew 16, and notice here starting in verse number 20. It says there, after, after, uh, after Peter gives his confession, it says this, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And we kind of scratch our head at that. Why would Jesus tell them not to tell others that he was the Christ? And he tells them for a very practical, uh, practical reason. It's because they weren't prepared for what the Messiah was going to do next. They had a different expectation of what the Messiah was going to come to do. And I think it's worth noting, well, what did they expect? Well, what, what they did expect is, is the Messiah to come in and to really topple their Roman overlords and to establish the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, here on earth where he would sit on the throne of his father David and he would rule with an iron scepter. That is what they expected. But of course, that's not at all what Jesus came to do during His first coming. There is going to come a day when Jesus comes again, and Jesus is coming again. We're going to, uh, as we recognize the Lord's Supper, why do we do that? We, we re remember the Lord's Supper because we remember His death until He comes. He is coming again, and when He comes again, He is going to come, and He is going to bring this kingdom, and it's going to be a kingdom here on earth where He rules and reigns for a thousand years. But it wasn't yet at that time. You see, they didn't understand that. And as a result of that, their expectations, they're, they're hearing the Messiah. And, and the revelation or the, the, the confession of Peter alone that, that, that this was the Christ, that was pretty profound. But it wasn't at all ex uh, what they expected as far as the Messiah to do. The Messiah, Messiah was supposed to come in and, and, and establish the kingdom now. But notice what Jesus tells them. He says, I don't want you to tell anybody that I'm the Christ. And then he says in verse 21, And from that time forth, he began, uh, 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 and from that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be killed. The Messiah is going to be killed. That's not what the Messiah is supposed to do. This is what Jesus was saying. That he was going to be killed and he was going to be raised again the third day. Now notice Peter's reaction to all this. Peter, the one with the great confession. And now Peter putting his foot in his mouth. It says there in verse 22, Then Peter took him, took Jesus, 
and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, it shall not be unto thee. Uh Uh-uh, that's not what the Messiah is supposed to do. No, okay, Peter, we're glad that you became part of the Trinity. You you know, there's a quartet now. You get to tell the rest of the Trinity what to do. No, this is what Peter was doing, though. He was rebuking the Lord. In other words, he had some expectations. He didn't understand what was going on. God, this is not how I understand Scripture to be. This is not what we've been taught in our churches, in our synagogues. This isn't what they told us when we were growing up. This ain't true. This ain't right. They struggled immensely. And this is where the principle comes in. Though it's not what you expect, follow me anyway. Follow me anyway. Notice in verse 23, But he turned and he said unto Peter, The man who gave him this great confession, who said it wasn't you uh, that, 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 that had said this, but it was, the, it was the, the Father who revealed this unto you. Then he says this to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Wow, what a rebuke. The man who just said that he's the Christ, and now he says, get behind me, Satan. What an about face. Verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his, uh, for his own soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his works. What is he talking about there? He's talking about the second coming. Of course, they didn't understand that, but Jesus is coming again, and he's coming with the angels. He's going to come to reward people of their works. Verse 28, Verily I say unto you, there should be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And of course, then we see the transfiguration after that. So though it's not what you expect, follow me anyway. This is the message of Jesus here. And of course, we talked about what they expected about the Messiah and what they expected about the the kingdom. Let me ask you this. What is it that you expected when you chose to follow Christ? You know what many people expect today? They expect their problems to be lowered or minimal or no problems at all, right? Kind of that wealth, health, and prosperity gospel. Well, if I become a Christian, I'm not going to have any problems. You know, God's going to take those away. And if God doesn't take those away, then then either God's not true or maybe there's something really wrong with me. That's how people think, right? What is it that you expected when you uh, you chose to follow Christ? Did you expect that your spouse was going to become a darling all of a sudden, right? I mentioned that a little bit this morning, and it's so true. The divorce, even among Christians, is, is, is not what it should be. You've heard me say that this morning. The divorce should not enter into your vocabulary. You know, when I married that woman, I made a commitment, a vow, and it's till death do us part. Now, that's a scary thing, because sometimes she thinks, maybe I need to kill that guy to get away from him. <laughs> Seriously, don't be thinking about that, okay? Is that serious, though? Think about those vows. Think about them for just a second. For richer or poor. Things were good when we had a lot of money, but now that we're poor and we're having problems, this relationship isn't working out for me. Oh, you made a vow before God for richer or for poor. In sickness and in health. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. It's a heartbreaking thing. When I went down to Craig Hospital, this the, the place where I went for rehab for the spinal cord injury. It's world renowned for traumatic brain injury and spinal, uh, spinal cord injury. But every once in a while, I hear people in the community or something like that that they, they get hurt, and and I try to make it down there. I go down to Denver and I visit those people and try to just give them a little pick me up, share the gospel with them, tell them there's brighter days ahead. I know it feels like everything is crumbling, uh, but believe me, God's got this, and you don't understand things now, but there's a purpose in what happened. But it's a heartbreaking thing to hear of those people. I'd go down there, and and this has happened more than once where I've heard of someone who maybe was married or was getting ready to be married, and as a result of that accident, the, the the other party couldn't handle that, and they left their spouse. Whatever happened to in sickness and in health? How about this one? For better or worse? Oh, whoa, that's a tough one. What's the worst thing? that your spouse could do to you. For a lot of people, it's adultery, right? Cheating on them. You made a vow. 
for better or for worse. You know, the Bible never prescribes divorce. Never. You know what it always prescribes? Reconciliation. It always prescribes reconciliation. It permits divorce in cases of adultery, but even in in cases of adultery, it prescribes reconciliation. These vows mean something. For sickness, or for, for, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, for richer or poor, we need some men and women who truly want to follow Christ and say, you know what? That train wreck over there that drives me to my wits end, that is my ministry, and I'm going to love that person like Christ loves the church. And we need that. We need more of that in the church today. Perhaps you thought when you are what, what you expected when following Christ is you were going to have no conflicts, right? Things you were going to have any conflict anymore. Or conflict was going to be easily resolved. No, your conflict just started. It really has. That your kids would be angels, right? Your kids take investment. I was telling somebody the other day, oh, I, I got on a little rant on Facebook talking about disciplining kids. I, I, I'm, I'm getting, now that I'm, I'm uh, kind of in my, what do they call it, the, the lame duck kind of months of my term in office, I'm, I'm a little more risky with putting things out there, particularly when it comes to spiritual things on my representative page. And I put something out there here just recently about discipline, right? Kids need discipline, okay? They need corrected. That you can correct kids and you can discipline kids all sorts of different ways, including swatting them on their little behind. I can never. Yes, you can. It's encouraged here in this church. You know, I smile every time I hear, uh, you know, or see a little mom, you know, take a little boy or girl into the bathroom, and then I hear that sweet sound, that scream. Ah, you know, I know something good is going on. The kid, the kid thinks it's awful. It's okay. My point is this, my point is, and, and of course I'm not talking about abuse, and you shouldn't abuse your children, you shouldn't discipline, you should have a cool head about you. But listen, you think about that. You, you, when you go out there into the world and you see someone's kids, and they're, I mean, you, you just marvel and be like, wow, your kids are so good. They didn't just get that way. It wasn't because, you know, they were just sweet kids. It's because mom and dad put some investment in that. Mom and dad disciplined them. Mom and dad, uh, mom and dad taught them how to fear authority and, to, and to, to teach them the fear of the Lord. Listen, if your kid does not respect you, how do you think they're going to respect their Sunday school teacher? If your kid does not respect you and you do not demand that respect, listen, you're not going to break their little ego. You're not going to break their self-esteem. You're going to help form them into the person that God created them to be because they need to fear God. How are they going to fear God if they don't fear you? If they don't have a healthy reverence for you? So these are things that we need to teach our kids. Maybe you expected that that you could, um, what did I write here? That you could that you could skate by without a whole lot of effort, right? That living a Christian life wasn't going to be that demanding of you. Maybe you thought that you, uh, uh, maybe, what did I write here? Maybe you had some other wrong ideas about doctrine, whatever it is. In other words, what is it that you expected about following Christ? And maybe, maybe then it begins to be a little bit tough. And you begin to be challenged a little bit, and your ideas and how you know your ideas of how you thought things worked, and you get this preacher up here who says things contrary to that, and is reading out of the Bible, and it kind of flips your flips the script, it flips the world upside down, and you think, wait a second here, this is what I expected, even though it's not what you expect. Follow me anyway. This is the G, this is what Jesus' message is here. Turn back with me over to Luke. Oh, let's see here, Luke. And we're going to start here again now in verse number. What do I got here? Verse 37. We're going to go on to lesson number three. Lesson number three is this. The truth must sink in for you to be greatly used. Now, I will tell you something about these portions of Scripture. We could spend a whole lot more time digging into these things. There's a whole lot of lessons here. And quite frankly, these, some of these Scriptures I wrestled with. And you're going to find out why here in just a moment. Notice what it says here in verse 37. And it came to pass, and on the next day, when they were come down from uh, the hill, much people met him. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and suddenly, uh, and he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth at him, and he foameth again, and bruising him hardly departeth from him. 
And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. So here you have this man, his, his, his son is demon-possessed. He's, he goes to the disciples. The disciples can't cast out this demon-possessed boy. They don't know what's going on. And notice what Jesus says here in verse 41. Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. Now here's the question that ran across my mind. Who is Jesus talking to? Is Jesus talking to this man? Is Jesus talking to the crowd that this man is, is, belongs to? Or is Jesus talking to the disciples who can't cast out this demon possessed, uh, uh, or can't cast, the, can't cast out this demon out of this boy? Who is it that Christ is talking to here? He has some pretty strong words. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, right? How long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring, bring thy son hither. Well, I think in order to, to understand this, we have to look into this a little bit more. There's, there's really two possibilities that I, that I came up with as far as who Jesus is talking to here. And the first I shared with you, I think, is this. I think that his disciples quite pos- or that, that Jesus is quite possibly referring to his disciples here in verse number 41. In other words, that this rebuke is not a rebuke necessarily at the crowd, but this rebuke is a rebuke at his, at his disciples. Now, you say, well, pastor, why would you think that? Well, just, just think about this. In, in, in chronological order from what we've just read here, we see here the last thing that Jesus said. Um, he, he talked about how that he was going to be t- uh, taken from them. Uh, this, is, this is before uh, his tr- in, information about the transfiguration there. But he goes on, verse 22, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes, be slain and raised again the third day. In other words, I'm going to be taken from you. I'm not always going to be with you. In other words, you're going to be on your own at some point. And I think this verse 41 here, as far as talking to his disciples here, uh, you'll notice what it says in verse, let's read on and, and you'll catch this a little bit. Verse 42 says this, and as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down, talking about this demon-possessed boy, and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God, and they wondered, everyone, at all the things that Jesus did. And notice next, and he said unto his disciples, this, this saying almost he seems to be out of place. He says this, let these sayings sink down into your ears. In other words... This is where we took lesson three from. The truth must sink in before you, uh, for you to be greatly used. Let these sayings sink down into your ears. Listen up. You have to hear what I'm saying, Jesus says. And what does he say? For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. It's almost a reminder of what he said before. I'm not going to be with you. It's as if Jesus is, is, uh, is, is saying this. I'm not going to be around for long. Let this sink in. You have to believe and you have to step it up. And I think that's one possible explanation here. Turn with me, if you will, over to Matt, or Matthew. Or excuse me, Mark. Let's turn over to Mark. Mark chapter 9. The other possibility, though, is that he's not talking to his disciples, but that he's talking actually to this man. In Mark chapter 9 and verse number 14, this is where we begin. We get a little more of the story here in Mark's account. It says this, And when he came to his disciples in verse 14, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. So catch the scene. Here's the disciples And who's questioning the disciples? The scribes are. The scribes are coming and asking them questions. And straightway, verse 15, all the people, when they beheld him, Jesus, uh, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? He's telling, he turns to the scribes, what are you questioning my disciples about? Okay, this is the context. Verse 17, And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and he gnasheth with his teeth, and he pineth away. And I spake unto thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. 
I went to your disciples and they couldn't cast them out. And notice what Jesus says here. Jesus actually says that he answers him, answers this man. Verse 19, he answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. So in a sense here, it almost seems that he, he's rebuking this man for unbelief. In other words, this man went to the disciples and, and kind of thought, yeah, maybe they can uh, get rid of the demon you know, or the, in, in this boy. Maybe they can't. I'll go and try it out and just you know, test the waters and see what happens. But he really didn't have full-fetched belief that they could do this. And maybe this is the rebuke here that Jesus is giving, oh, faithless generation. Notice what it says, and there's more evidence of this later on. Verse 20, And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, and wallowing, foaming. And he, and he asked his father, How long ago uh, since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it cast him into the fire and into the water and dis- and to, to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. It sounds like this man really isn't even sure that Jesus can do this. If you can, if you can do something, please help us. I'm desperate. Notice what Jesus said in verse 23. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. If you can have faith, if you can just believe. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I believe, God, I'm, everything I've got within me, this, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense, but I believe, help thou my unbelief. And when Jesus, uh, of course, you can, you can know the rest of the story, then Jesus casts it out. Kind of an interesting thing. So which one is it? Is he rebuking his disciples? Maybe. It seems to be that way in Luke. Is he rebuking the man? In uh, Mark's gospel, it seems to be that way. Maybe he's rebuking both. Maybe the statement, oh, faithless generation, is rebuke all the way around everybody that's there. You have to know the truth. Here's, here's the, the crux of the issue. You have to know the truth and believe it and then be unwavering for God to be greatly used of you. You have to know the truth and believe it and then be unwavering for God to greatly be used of you. Let the truth or the truth must sink in for you to be greatly used. And finally, the last thing here, lesson number four, is this. The greatest will be considered the least in the world. Turn with me back over to Luke's Gospel as we finish up. Again, the overarching message is, I am the Christ, and I'm going to be taken away from you and given in the hands of sinful men. But we have these four lessons. If you follow me, it's going to cost you. Though it's not what you expect, follow me anyway. The truth must sink in for you to be greatly used. Believe the truth. Know the truth. And then the greatest will be considered least in the world. I find this actually somewhat humorous and almost sad. It's almost a little bit pathetic in in, in some ways. Uh, Notice what it says here, starting in verse 46. (laughs) I actually, go, go, back, go back up to verse 44, where Jesus says that he gives kind of the rebuke. Let these saints sink down in your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of sinful men. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them, and they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. Then there arose a reasoning among them of which of them should be greatest. Their minds are on something completely different. Right? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? It says there in, uh, in uh, verse 47, And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set, by, uh, and, and set him by him, and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this little child in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all shall be, uh, the same shall be great. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. Now this almost doesn't seem to fit. Why would John be saying that? Well, again, notice the context. Jesus says what in verse 48? It seems like the disciples still don't get it, what Jesus is trying to tell them. But Jesus says there, whosoever, in verse 48, whosoever shall receive this child in what? In my name. And so John, thinking about this, he says, well, wait a second. Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and we forbade him 
because he followeth not with us. He's not following along with us, so we told him to knock it off. Don't be casting out devils in Jesus' name because you're not a part of Jesus. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. So there's so much that we can say here. Uh, and I'm going to let you chew on some of this and just grapple with this. Study these things out on your own. Uh, we're going to end here, if you will. Uh, turn back with me over to uh, Matthew's Gospel. We'll end there in Matthew's Gospel as we read a little bit more of what Jesus says. What, uh, I think it's Matthew. I've got to find it here. Matthew 18, if I'm not mistaken. Matthew 18. In verse number 1, it says this, And at that time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And notice what Jesus says here, a little bit different than Luke's gospel. And said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. In other words, what, what causes you to get into the kingdom of heaven? Childlike faith. Childlike faith. Simple believing. The belief of a child. You have to believe that about Jesus. Verse 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. What does Jesus think about little kids coming to church? He thinks an awful lot. What does he think about little kids believing on Jesus? Oh, he loves it. And don't you dare offend them. Boy, what a strong warning for us as parents, right? And grandparents. Oh, be careful. Be so careful. The lesson is this. The greatest will be considered the least in the world. You want to be the greatest in the kingdom? Be a servant. Be the servant of all. Be the least in this world and be great in the kingdom of heaven. That's how you become great. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for these lessons here. Lord, these are, these are not always easy things. And, and, and truthfully, Lord, as I, as I studied out the scripture, just I questioned some of these things, wanting to know the truth and and almost sometimes not feeling settled on things. Lord, I'm thankful for your Holy Spirit. I'm thankful that you guide us into all truth. And I'm thankful for these truths that you re you've revealed to us tonight. Lord, I pray if there's someone here that does not know Christ as your Savior, how, how is it that they could become great in the kingdom? They can receive Christ by childlike faith, believing on Jesus. It's what it takes. It's faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's what you said in your Word. And if we simply will believe you and what you say in your word, you'll save us. If we believe on Christ. So if there's someone here this evening, Lord, and they have never trusted Christ as their Savior, even now as I'm praying, maybe they would trust Christ as their Savior and give their all to Him. Lord, I pray that you would help us with these other truths. Sometimes our, our faith is not what we expect. Following Christ is not what we expect. It doesn't go the way that we want it to. It's not what we thought inside of our imagination. And God, you beckon us to follow you anyway, even when we don't understand. Help us, help us to be those kind of people. And then God, help us for the truth to sink in so that we can be greatly used to know your truth and believe it. God, help us with these things. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to go ahead at this time.